Hi everyone, we're so excited that you've chosen to join us today to hear about the Australian Social Progress Index. Uh, Isabella and I have been working on this project for the last 18 months and it really has become our baby. So to have it out and to be able to talk about the results is really exciting. To introduce myself, my name is Dr. Megan Weir and I'm a research fellow at CSI University of New South Wales. And today I'm presenting to you on the lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I would like to pay my respect to elders past and present. Isabella, would you like to introduce yourself? Megan, my name is Isabella Saunders and I'm a research assistant at CSI. Today I'm on Darug land and I also pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Thanks, Lisa. So if you are comfortable, we would actually love it if you put in the chat what lands you are on today. If you're not sure, this is a really good opportunity to find out and often your local council website will have information on the traditional owners. I've reflected on this quite a bit during the process of developing the index. When we talk about progress, we're often looking forward to the future and thinking about what needs to change. But we also need to be willing to look backwards and acknowledge the historical injustices done to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and recognise that things like colonisation and the stolen generations are still having impacts today. So it's important to recognise that we are all currently on land that where sovereignty was never ceded and this country called Australia remains Aboriginal land. Before we get started, there's an opportunity for you to provide some input and interact with us a bit on what you think would be good indicators of social progress for Australia. Seeking this input from a range of people is a really important part of developing the most representative social progress index possible. So we would love to hear your thoughts. We'll go through the results at the end of the presentation to get a sense of whether there are particular indicators where there are lots of agreement. So what we'd like to invite you to do is to go to the website menti.com and use the code 753670. And what that will do is ask you to put in some ideas about how you would think about or measure social progress in Australia. And what that will do is create a bit of a word cloud that we can have a look at at the end of the presentation. So feel free to submit your ideas throughout the presentation, but Isabella will be talking through how we define indicators a little later on in the presentation. So for those of you who are less familiar with the Centre for Social Impacts, we are a collaboration between the University of New South Wales, Swinburne University of Technology and the University of Western Australia. Put broadly, our aim and purpose is to catalyse positive social change. This means taking an honest look at our society, where there are disparities and injustices, and our focus is on equipping communities and organisations with the skills to be able to work together for a more equitable society. A major project that we are currently undertaking is called the Amplify Social Impact Project, where we aim to help the for-purpose sector better understand our current society, its needs and ability to respond to social issues. And one of those focuses is on economic inequality and its impact on social progress. Australia is undeniably an economically successful country. We have seen continuous growth in our gross domestic product or GDP over the last 28 years including relative stability through the global financial crisis. This means that we have young people who are completing high school and university and entering the workforce in social conditions where there has only ever been growth in their lifetime. And obviously at the moment with the current COVID crisis, this is um, something that is on a lot of people's minds in terms of where are we going economically? What impact is this gonna have? So the economy, keeping it strong and making policy decisions that first and foremost centre the economy is a strong focus, particularly for our current government. A recent example was the government's response to the devastation of the bushfires across Australia and Australia's response to climate change. Any response first and foremost must not jeopardise Australia's vibrant and viable economy. An issue that I think a lot of people are aware of is that talking about Australia's economy and GDP growth can feel kind of off when dealing with the realities of the communities where there are high levels of financial stress, housing stress and job stress. There is an issue if we're only talking about GDP per capita and using that as a sole indication that the needs and circumstances of all communities across Australia are progressive. So we really need a way of measuring quality of life in Australia that isn't just about money. So during the 20th century, and I think this still continues to this day to a certain extent, there was an assumption that economic development automatically generated social progress. So if GDP per capita was going up, so was the progressiveness of a society. However, we know that in many instances, economic development doesn't automatically result in social progress. 
In some cases, it can even harm social progress. A relative example for Australia is the impact of the mining boom, both on the environment and also the impact on communities where mining companies have resided for a few years and then left once the resources have been fully mined. Other ways of generating income, such as the exportation of arms and privatisation of prisons, undeniably can have a negative impact on individuals either here or abroad. The relationship is also not necessarily a one-way stream. Sometimes social progress affects economic development. The state of basic education and health in a region could have impacts on how fit and able the workforce is, for example. So in order to truly understand inclusive growth, we need a measure of social progress that is independent of economic measures that we can then correlate against the economy, but also means that our understanding of the society that we're in is less muddied by dollar values. So Amplify Social Impact has partnered with the international not-for-profit, the Social Progress Imperative, in creating Australia's first social progress index, or the SBI. The SPI has been calculated at a global level since 2013, and it gives us an indication of how countries relative to one another compare on its ability to meet the basic human needs of citizens, enhance and sustain quality of life, and create conditions for all individuals to reach their full potential. So we define social progress as the capacity of a society to meet the basic human needs of its citizens, establish the building blocks that allow citizens and communities to enhance and sustain the quality of their lives, and create the conditions for all individuals to reach their full potential. It's these three domains, basic human needs, foundations of well-being, and opportunity alongside the economy that we believe will lead to inclusive growth. An important part of the index is also that in order for social progress overall to improve, each of these domains must improve. There's no one concept that is more important than the other. So the Social Progress Index offers an accessible and actionable assessment of the health of society that is independent from economic measures. So it's a framework that aims to capture not just present challenges and today's priorities, but also the challenges that countries will face as their economic prosperity rises. The index reveals relative performance compared to a country's economic peers and assesses a country's success in turning economic progress into improved social outcomes. So the index offers what we call universally important questions. So these are concerns that are relevant to any country, state or territory, and any indicator that we included in the index needed to be aimed at addressing one of these questions. So there are 12 components within the SPI, and they cover issues such as healthcare, education, the environment, and also inclusiveness. So the index is distinct from other tools in that it includes only social and environmental indicators and it measures outcomes, not inputs. So that means that we were less interested in, for example, how much money was spent on a campaign to enrol more children in preschool, but we were more focused instead on the proportion of children who actually ended up in preschool. We also needed to include indicators that represented as many states and territories as possible to ensure that we were capturing the interrelated aspects of a thriving society across all Australian jurisdictions. Finally, the indicators that we included needed to be actionable. So we wanted to create a practical tool that helps leaders and decision makers implement policies and programs to, to drive faster social progress. Throughout the process of creating the Australian SPI, uh, we have engaged in over 50 expert stakeholder consultations so this has included academics who hold expertise in particular components within the SPI, representatives from the not-for-profit and peak representative bodies, industry, and also local and national government departments. The purpose of this consultation process was to get buy-in on the index, as well as getting input on what would be on the wish list of possible indicators for the best possible Australian Social Progress Index. We were then able to use this wish list as a starting point to determine the potential data sources and the indicators that we could include in the index. So indicator selection and calculating the index was then a process of taking each suggested indicator and following this decision tree. Um, so we, need to we needed to have indicators that were from reputable and rigorous data sources um, for the purposes of our index as well, ones that were updated annually 
and also um, indicators that covered 95 to 100% of the Australian states and territories. We did, however, have some limitations in looking at indicators. So some of the issues that we came across when collating indicators included inconsistent measurement. So there were surveys that were collected every few years, but there wasn't a clear public schedule available for when the data would actually be collected. We also found, particularly with environmental indicators, that state or territory environmental agencies had their own methods of collecting and reporting on environmental data, which meant that there were indicators that weren't very consistent and they therefore weren't comparable across the states and territories. We also found some really great indicators that were being measured within a state or territory, but because it wasn't being measured across the country as a whole, we weren't able to include it in the index. Um, we tried finding adequate indicators that would capture environmental concerns that are relevant to Australia, such as deforestation and drought, but we found that these were either irregularly updated, not measured by all states and territories, or they just simply didn't exist. Um, and then in October, we found the Air Quality Index. So when we first came across the Air Quality Index, we anticipated having a bit of pushback to using air quality as an adequate indicator of environmental quality in Australia. But then the bushfires started in November. So as we all began checking the PM 2.5 levels each day, it became clear that how Australia was being impacted by bushfires is inherently tied to how Australia's environment is able to respond to disasters such as bushfires. So because of these limitations in data availability, the indicators that we ended up including were also quite culturally homogenous. So within this, we had to be quite mindful as well of the indigenous indicators that we included, where we had to acknowledge the risk of reproducing a deficit approach narrative. Mm. So when we talk about a deficit approach, this refers to how often in statistics and the media, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are often compared to non-Indigenous people and usually as a way of showing how Indigenous people are less than or more at risk than non-Indigenous people, which can then further implicitly or explicitly cement racist ideas that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are a problem. Our position is that these discrepancies occur as a result of poor policy that fails to acknowledge the ways in which culture and things like intergenerational trauma can play into outcomes. And we didn't want that in the index to be another tool that could reinforce that belief. So for example, under personal freedom and choice, we included the disparity between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children in out-of-home care as a rate ratio as one of our indicators. In New South Wales, for example, for every one non-Indigenous child that is put in out-of-home care, 10 Indigenous children receive the same treatment. Including this indicator as a matter of personal freedom and choice demonstrates that Indigenous parents and children are clearly not being afforded the same treatment when it comes to child protection. And there is something about how this government service is being implemented that needs to change. We also found that it was difficult to find indicators that were able to celebrate parts of Indigenous culture that contribute positively to social progress. However, as two non-Indigenous researchers, we also feel that it's not our place to try and create or measure these outcomes but instead look for opportunities to pass this work on to Indigenous academics and communities. So it was these insights um, that really solidified our passion for getting data agencies and academics to really work together on shared approaches to data collection so that we're not um, just collecting the same or similar indicators, but instead collecting robust indicators really well. So once we were able to source the available indicators, we went through a process of correlating the indicators under each component of the index to make sure that the indicators included hung together in such a way to suggest that they were representing or measuring a single component. We also went about a process of setting best and worst case scenarios in order to calculate an index that ranges from zero to 100. So these utopias and dystopias, as we called them, were based on both national and international goals where they were available. So for example, for example the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but if these weren't available, we set the utopias and dystopias based on historical data points. There were some instances where we had to manipulate the data slightly, such as imputing missing values by using the previous year or a similar state or territory. Um, also, for indicators that had a non-normal distribution, we also applied logarithmic transformations 
or in the case of Northern Territory data, a couple of times we had to cap the score with the next lowest data point and add a buffer. Um, also, for those who are interested, you can see the full methodology paper on the Amplify website where we talk about um, which indicators we transformed and how, and there's a bit more information around that. How many indicators did we consider, Isabella? I think we started with like 450, yeah. 500. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the giant wish list that we had. Yeah, and we ended up with about 52, I think, wasn't it? About 52, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so here on the screen are some examples of the indicators that we ended up actually including. So um, as Megan just mentioned, in total there are around 50 indicators, um, making up the separate components, dimensions and the overall social progress index score. So examples of indicators that we use to measure shelter, for example, were estimated homelessness rate and social housing overcrowding. For health and wellness, we used community mental health treatment and cardiovascular mortality. And within personal rights, we included such indicators as voter registration and the rate of recorded sexual assault. So we're about to pull up the website where you can actually interact with the results of the Social Progress Index. Um, while Megan's doing that, feel free to take the opportunity to go into the menti.com page that Megan suggested earlier, where you can put in your ideas of indicators of social progress in Australia. So these are the things that you think accurately capture social progress and what that means. Um, they don't necessarily have to be indicators that are already being collected, but it can be really useful for getting a sense of what people think are important ways of defining progress within the context of Australia. So, apologies. Isabel, I'm just checking you can see my Chrome screen. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. great. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> so it was this process of consultation, identifying what indicators are available and setting limits on what we thought would be the best and worst case scenarios for Australia's social progress that led us to this. With the website, you can click through how Australia's states and territories are performing relative to one another overall on social progress. And it's really important to note here and make clear that these scores are how socially progressive the society and its policies are, not actually the people that live in that state or territory. So if we click through between 2015 and 2018, we can see that there are some consistent trends. The ACT was consistently the number one region each year, while Western Australia and the Northern Territory placed seventh and eighth. Also, these scores are for the state and territory as a whole. In the future, we will hopefully be able to calculate an index that reflects things like remoteness, cultural and religious differences, experiences of people with a disability, et cetera. So the order and scores of the states and territories on social progress may seem surprising, or it might make sense, but it can be helpful to see areas where in general across Australia, we appear to be doing well and where there needs to be improvement. So for example, if we look at nutrition and basic medical care, Broadly, it was a very high performing component, except for the Northern Territory. But when we consider the indicators that we use to create this component, factors such as higher proportions of residents who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander might help us to understand why there was such a stark disparity. So some of those indicators that we included were infant mortality, uh, rotavirus prevalence, premature mortality, and the Indigenous mortality rate, comparing Indigenous to non-Indigenous people. So looking at these uh, results and how they align to these indicators might help us to understand why there's such a stark disparity. And clearly there are policy decisions or ways of managing these indicators that are simply not working or aren't suitable for the Northern Territory. But hopefully by highlighting this performance relative to other states and territories, it can help to jumpstart discussions about the need for policy reform and who is actually involved in those decisions. Where we found that there was a bit more of a variability or lower performance was the personal freedom and choice domain. So this included things, oh, sorry, there was room for improvement around things like inclusiveness and personal freedom and choice. So these are more complex issues than something like nutrition and basic medical care because it's less about how much money you have to spend on improving an issue and more about what kinds of social contexts exist that contribute to how much individuals feel like they have personal rights, freedom of choice, and they feel included. 
These are also the issues which I think many of you who have joined us today are focused on trying to improve within your own communities. And the hope is that the SBI can give a common language that we can all use to help improve opportunity across the board. So you can also select um, by state or territory and see how the areas scored across the whole of the SPI framework across the four years of the index that we calculated. So as Megan mentioned earlier, the ACT ranked first for all four years that the index was calculated, and it also ranked first in many of the components that make up the index. Um, however, as you can see, um, the overall SPI ranking for 2018 was just under 70 out of 100, which means that we still think that the ACT can do better. We can also see within the index that there are some areas where the ACT performed really well. So there was high performance on personal rights, access to advanced education, and access to basic knowledge. So these are definitely things to be celebrated. However, there were also lower scoring components within the ACT as well. So personal freedom and choice, inclusiveness and environmental quality were the lowest scoring components for ACT. This is what a great value the index is, where we can look at the results at a state and territory level. We can see where there needs to be specific targeted policies that prioritise improving the opportunity and environmental quality, for example, in the ACT. So how about a state that had a bit more variability in its rankings? Victoria had some really interesting contrasts in where it showed good performance, and there was also unexpected lower performance in some areas. Victoria ranked first in nutrition and basic medical care, and also in health and wellness. However, it ranked seventh, so second last, in personal freedom and choice, and similarly had low scores in environmental quality and access to information and communication. This really demonstrates how the index works. How high a state or territory can score is limited by where there are lower performing components of social progress. Finally, we can see the SPI and its components represented as trends across the four years that the index was calculated. This demonstrates the trends of overall SPI scores from 2015 to 2018. We can see here, based on the teal dots compared to the dark navy dots, that social progress overall largely improved across all the states and territories between 2015 and 2018. The Northern Territory, for example, increased from a score of 25.24 in 2015 to 28.02 in 2018. Our plans in the near future is to look at if there were any particular policies or events that actually occurred within each state or territory that may have contributed to changes in the scores, either within individual components or in their social progress score overall. Oh, we're just going back to the slides now. No, all good. <laughs> So what does this have to do with the economy? If we're assuming that economic progress generates a socially progressive society, we would expect to see a relationship similar to the one shown on this slide. So if we're using gross state product per capita as a more localized version of gross domestic product, any increase in GSP per capita should also show an increase in SPI scores. But we didn't see this. Western Australia and the Northern Territory have some of the highest GSP per capita in Australia based on exports, mining and the fact that smaller populations mean that there's fewer people to average across. But WA and the Northern Territory also had the consistently lowest social progress scores. So this says to us that focusing only on economic measures as an indicator of the quality of life and opportunity for residents is a really misleading metric, especially for people living in Western Australia and the Northern Territory. What was even more interesting to us is that when we looked at SPI and how that relates to health, uh, to wealth at an individual level, and so this is correlating SPI scores with the median net health, household wealth of a household. So here we see a positive relationship. So what are the economic opportunities that are afforded to individuals and households in the face of state or territory economic growth? And how can we use the findings of the Australian SBI to enrich conversations about trickle down economics? How can we shift this relationship so that we're seeing at a state and territory level when gross state product rises, so does social progress. 
So we can talk about Australia's vibrant and viable economy. However, we need to recognise that just because Australia's GDP is going up, it doesn't automatically mean that social and living conditions will automatically improve as well. We need to interrogate what it is that we do with this wealth. How can we shift our systems and policies to ensure that our economy is working to make sure everyone in living in Australia has their basic human needs met, as well as the opportunity to thrive and be indiscriminately included in their communities? We also need to remain aware that talking about GDP per capita can falsely imply that everyone in Australia hovers roughly around the same number in terms of income. We know that there are groups in our communities which systemically have fewer options and opportunity to benefit from this wealth. What needs to change if we're committed to understanding and addressing inequality in Australia? We need to support the use of consistent and regular data that gives us the most accurate understanding of what's going on. And when we talk about what constitutes progress, we need to include the voices of those who are marginalised. So if you're wanting to understand how socially progressive New South Wales is on shelter, for example, make sure to include people who have experienced homelessness to give insight into what should be measured as outcomes. We need to be using tools like the SBI to highlight where there needs to be policy or social change. By directly correlating and showing that these that the relationship between GSP and social progress isn't automatically positive, we can start demanding better answers to questions and asking for better policy solutions from our leaders. The Australian SBI provides us with the opportunity to look at Australia's states and territories and understand where each jurisdiction is moving towards the best case Australia and where there are gaps and rooms for improvement. By using a global framework and shared methodology, we've been able to create a robust insight into Australian societies and communities. So this is by no means a definitive score on Australian social progress, but it is allowing us to start a conversation and suggest a shared language that we can use together to aim for a better Australia. The index shows us states and territories and how they're scoring on components of social progress relative to one another. We suggest that while we want all states and territories to achieve high scores across domains of the social progress index, the ways in which we get there will vary across jurisdictions. This is where working together, particularly with representatives living in communities in the state and territory, becomes a vital next step. So we can see from the results that global goals have helped to focus attention on improving lives. Components that were associated with the Millennium Development Goals, such as access to basic healthcare and nutrition and basic education, showed some of the highest scores across the country. With the social progress imperative, we're currently working on applying the SPI results for Australia to the Sustainable Development Goals to help to amplify the conversation on pursuing and achieving these goals. The index also shows us outcomes of policy. It's less interested in how much money is being spent on community development programs and education campaigns, but instead shows whether that investment has resulted in the desired outcomes. It encourages a reflexive discussion around whether and why a policy is not achieving its intended outcomes and highlights where policy could or should be done differently. Finally, it also shows us how the components of social progress are inherently interlinked. For overall social progress to improve, all components within the index must improve. We want the SPI to be a tool that can help to inform better policy. As I've mentioned, it can function as a tool to give insight into where there are areas of social progress that are flourishing for particular jurisdictions. And by using a standardized measure where states and territories can be compared, we can better demonstrate where outcomes are quantifiably improving societies. We believe that everyone can find a component within the SBI that represents their cause. If you're a minister for education, a school principal, or a not-for-profit that focuses on early childhood education, looking at things like access to both basic and advanced education in Australia should help identify where there are opportunities for development. It also encourages collaboration. We want this to be a tool that can help governments to partner with the not-for-profit and for-purpose sector to partner on shared causes as represented by components of the index and to help identify opportunities to work together to achieve common goals. The first Australian SPI provides the beginning of a conversation about how we could measure social progress within Australia. As a first step, it is a tool that is using best available data to demonstrate the extent to which basic human needs, foundations of well-being, and opportunity are playing out across Australia's states and territories. It helps us to shift our attention away solely from economic indicators as measures of progress, but also start talking about progress in terms of inclusive growth. Thanks everyone, that's our presentation.
Thanks so much, Megan and Isabella. Um, I was going to send you the questions, but I'm not able to technically. So what I might do is just read them out to you. If that's okay. Sure. We've had a fair few, which is great. Um, and they're still coming in, which is awesome. So maybe Megan and Isabella, if you could turn on your chat. Yeah. But I'll start reading out the first few that happened at the beginning. So from Ashara, um, is data for this index being collected annually and on an ongoing basis? Yep, so I think one thing that we probably didn't make as clear in the presentation is that we didn't actually collect the data ourselves. It was required that it was data that was collected by a, um, a different agency. So it was only based on what data was already being collected. Um, and one of the um, things that we needed when we were considering indicators was whether it was being collected annually, just because we were having to um, calculate an index that ranged between 2015 and 2018. Um, because otherwise it would just be giving us the same scores and there wouldn't be enough variance. Was there anything you'd want to add to that, Isabella? Um, no, that pretty much sums it up, yeah. 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 Okay, next question from Angarad. Sorry if I've got the pronunciation of that wrong. Uh, indicators, what is the split of lag and lead? Lag and lead. I'm not sure that I... Okay, maybe if, Brad, um, if you could unmute yourself and ask that question yourself, if you're still here. Thanks, Rhonda. Yeah, it's Anne Harrod, and thank you for ah. kindly inviting me to um, <laughs> share the pronunciation of a Welsh, a lovely Welsh name, which causes lots of... Um, <laughs> Sorry. No, it's wonderful. Um, what I'm really interested there in is, um, is knowing, you know, which indicators are telling us that we've done well as opposed to which of the indicators are telling us that we're actually going to do better. So in thinking about um, indicators, what we know is that we, if we focus too much on the lag, we get a confirmation, a potential confirmation bias. But I think what I'm trying to get at is what are the things that we believe we're doing today that are going to make a difference and can we then validate um, rather than um, leaving long periods of time between things that are telling us that what we did in the past was was something meaningful. Um, it's an important thing that I think needs to be not necessarily um, all one or all the other, but certainly a good blend where we know that policy, um, we if we make a policy change, what, what are we actually using? What's the instrument of change? So the indicator we, you know, we have to come up with an in indicator which we believe is going to give us the evidence of the, the valid value of that change, as opposed to waiting for a metric that is going to um, tell us um, long after the fact. I hope that I hope that helps. Yeah, it it does. Are you happy for me to answer this one? As mm -hmm. well? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think um, that's a really good question and something that we've thought a fair bit about. It's maybe um, a slight difference in terms of what the objective is of the indicator, uh, of the index, sorry. So something like the social progress index is very focused on where we're at currently. But there are other indices out there that are either currently developed or are being developed. So the Australian National Development Index or ANDI is one example. And that one's very focused on the Australia that we want to have. And so I think that if we consider something like the SPI and ANDI together, we can sort of talk about the Australia that we've got at the moment. And that's based on what is currently being measured and what we know is what's going on. But then we can be using the consultative methods of the ANDI by collaborating together, hopefully, to be able to work out what is it that Australians want to have as the Australia as like the dream Australia, essentially. And that can help to identify indicators that we want. And then we can start um, really kind of campaigning to start collecting that kind of data. And I think that's an important process that came through with this as well. And when we look at the suggested indicators in a minute as well, we can see what are people considering to be important indicators of social progress in Australia and what's going on when we're not actually measuring those kinds of things. And if we can kind of be uh, creating that conversation more, hopefully we can create um, a bit of an impetus to start measuring some of those things in the future. I hope that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, I think one of the things when you're taking from like sort of a, a universal index such as the SPI um, framework, it's not gonna be totally tailored to what Australia's aims are in terms of where we wanna lead, but it is a starting point and it's a way to start that conversation. Thank you. 
Um, another point is that if you want to get in touch with Megan and Isabella um, after this, I'm sure they're more than welcome to talk. Please to do. Further. <laughs> um, Thank you. Got a few more questions actually, and heaps are coming through on the chat, but I might just get to those initial ones. A lot of people are asking um, how granular can your indicators go? Are they just national and state? Or do they go LGA? I've heard you answer this before. So I'll... Over to you, Isabella. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We would love to get the data more granular. Um, unfortunately, the data that was available in Australia, we could only find to a state and territory level, and even that was sometimes a little bit tricky. Um, so definitely in future, um, I mean, obviously we're really aiming to campaign for better, more granular data collection, and if we can get these things down to a community level, it will speak more, I think, to the specific needs of um, different areas of Australia. And that goes for as well, um, I saw a couple of questions going through with different demographics. Um, if the data is collected to that level, then that is definitely something that we would love to do in the future because it's obviously a really important piece. Um, but yeah, we need to campaign for the data collection. So. <laughs> And there's a few different ways that we can um, navigate that a little bit as well. So, for example, if, um, I don't know, the ACT government decided that they wanted an ACT social progress index, we could work with them to go through the process of identifying indicators that are available within ACT that can be broken down at the community level. Because as Isabella mentioned when we were talking about what indicators were available, um, a lot of the time there were states individual states or territories that were doing their own data collection, but because it wasn't being replicated across the country, we weren't able to use it. But if, for example, ACT was measuring something on, um, you know, social inclusion that was able to be broken down at that more community level, then we could definitely include it. The other option is um, not necessarily having to calculate a full index, but it could be working with um, a government or an organisation in terms of developing what your community or LGA social progress framework would look like. And so going through a period of consultation of, you know, discussing and talking about what would social progress look like in your environment, and then using that as a way to help determine policy and benchmark outcomes in the future. Okay, um, I can see we're not going to get to all the questions. So what I might suggest is that we contact a lot of the people who are asking them if we don't get to them ourselves. Sure. I'll pass on the details to Megan and Isabella. But continuing on, because it's uh, nearly quarter past one, we've got another 15 minutes. Um, what about the number of organisations, this is from David, what about the number of organisations with reconciliation action plans or is that too much an output and not an outcome? We did look at RAPs, um, but they were more of an output than an outcome in terms of... Um, you know, determining what, what's the outcome of that, how can we um, integrate that into um, the framework itself. But yeah, things around um, reconciliation action plans and what companies were doing, that was always a bit of a tricky, tricky one that we tried that to integrate also, where we could. Yeah, that was also a tricky one um, in terms of like where, by comparing states and territories, like how do you disaggregate mm -hmm. where that organisation actually sits in which state and territory for national organisations and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, um, I like this one from Meg. Uh, how do you measure personal freedom and choice? So we can tell you the indicators that went into that one. Uh, so personal freedom and choice were two of the ones where we include the Indigenous rate ratio. So that was proportion of children or rate ratio of children in out-of-home care and also the rate ratio of abuse substantiations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children. But then also interestingly, that one correlated really highly with self-rated perceptions of public, tra public transport safety. So how safe did you feel on public transport? Um, so that was like an interesting, uh, you know, mix of indicators. But I think to us that really demonstrated, you know, um, feeling safe on public transport or public transport is meant to be something that's accessible to everyone, but the way that it's experienced and how safe and how much you feel like you have choice on whether to use public transport is something that's going to vary, very um, quite a bit across different communities and different people. Uh, so that was like a, a bit of an interesting mix of indicators, wasn't it, Isabella? Mm, um, yeah, yeah, that one was very interesting. Yeah. And I think also the other thing to say is that probably the opportunity indicators around inclusiveness and personal freedom and choice they were probably the harder indicators to find in that uh you know these kind of more subjective well-being um indicators are being collected 
maybe on a bit of a smaller level. So it was that the sample sizes weren't big enough to be able to apply to the rest of Australia or they were being collected sort of um, within a state or there wasn't really that geographic information. So um, if we can work with people that are working on sort of like social inclusion and things like that to really get a better sense of what's going on nationally, that would be awesome. Um, a few people are asking this one. How is this index informing policy in the not-for-profit sector? So we released the index at the end of February and we were able to present an Australian Parliament House, which was pretty great. Um, and what we are planning on doing is breaking this down as almost state and territory report cards so that individual state and territory governments can see where they're performing well and where there's underperformance relative to other states and territories that have similar economic kind of standing in terms of their um, GSP. So what we hope to do with that is to help to use that to advocate for um, increased policy change or service delivery um, specific to kind of particular areas where there might be underperformance. But obviously, since uh, COVID has started, things have changed a little bit for us. Um, and I think there's an interesting question there in terms of like, what can the SBI tell us in terms of how, um, you know, how well equipped is a state or territory in terms of responding with health and wellness or basic nutrition and med medical care. Um, but yeah, that has toned down a little bit just because of the realities of shifting. But we do want it to be something that is accessible and can be referred to and that we are people that can talk that through with government hopefully. Okay. Uh, from Joe, can the data be sorted by demographic groups, for example, women over 50, young people 18 to 25, and reflected across the states? Do you want to go on this one, Isabella? Yeah, so um, similar to the um, granularity of diving deeper into LGA, that's definitely something that we're looking to in the future with better data collection, um, it would be a really useful insight to see how different demographic groups score on different areas. And I'm sure there would be some hugely stark disparities. Um, but yeah, again, that's the thing that we have to consult and advocate for um, getting data collection actually on that level and um, making sure that the data sources that we're using um, do actually disaggregate by age or another really interesting one that we would love to look at would be comparing um, urban and regional and rural and yeah people with experiences of disability and yeah so that's for the future yeah. and I, I think the thing to go back with that as well is that it's not necessarily representing how socially progressive women or 18 to 24 year olds are but it's like how um, how socially progressive is the context of the society so um, in the European Commission, for example, they've done a youth social progress index and the social progress imperative are in the process of developing a global women's social progress index. So that will be considering index, uh, indicators that are directly related to how it is that women experience social progress, for in instance. So that kind of shifts the, the focus of what you're looking for when you're looking for indicators. Uh, but it's definitely an opportunity in the future. Um, do you want to pop into the chat box now because there's some more recent questions? <clears throat> Just having a look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think um, th there's some really good points just about local government and also city data, how that influences data for the whole state. And so um, I think it's really important that we um, look at things like how data is being collected um, and we don't try and apply sort of survey findings to necessarily say that that's what life is like for the whole of New South Wales, for example. So um, I'm thinking of water and sanitation as an indicator. And so my experience as someone living in Sydney and my experience of water and sanitation is going to be very different compared to someone that's living in Dubbo where, um, you know, they still are in quite a bit of drought and it was really severe previously. So we just have to be really careful in terms of how granular or how applicable we're trying to make these results. Um, so we do try to be careful with it. Um, but as we mentioned, it's the first step, it's starting that discussion. And um, if we can be sort of using that, those insights to further um, create discussion about what needs to change in data collection, that would be really fantastic. 
Is there anything uh, that's jumping out at you, Isabella, that you'd like to talk? Um, well, just going back to that point about um, the differences um, of how indicators are reflected between urban and rural areas um, within cities and out, that's something um, going back to the data limitations that we found within sampling. So there were definitely some surveys that we found, particularly in the Northern Territory, where um, the samples of people that they surveyed were almost entirely in Darwin. And we know that the experiences of people living within Darwin are obviously going to be quite different to people living in rural areas of the Northern Territory. So yeah, that's definitely something that we were mindful of throughout, but unfortunately had limitations as well. Just on that, there's a question from Jane. It's interesting that the NT is ranked so highly for inclusiveness. What was included in the inclusiveness indicator? Can you remember that off the top of your head, Isabella? Top of my head. No, I, it was, no. <laughs> I think it was uh, a ratio in um, the gender pay gap. Mm -hmm. And there was also a the ratio in underemployment. We can check the methodology just because it's been a while since I've looked at the yeah, individual maybe. indicators. But yeah. it, it was nice to see Northern Territory rank a bit higher on yeah. one of the components. Yeah, that was a really interesting component because it was one where Northern Territory did rank really highly, but um, quite surprisingly, um, Victoria actually ranked quite low in inclusiveness, which, yeah, is something I think that we were kind of reflecting on that, you know, your image of Victoria, especially like just thinking about the differences between urban Melbourne and then what is actually happening in the state as a whole. Um, so, that yeah, that was a really interesting component for us overall, I think. Hmm. There's a question from Andrew I can probably take as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Andrew's asked if the indicators are weighted or do the, all the indicators contribute equally to the overall SPI? So um, the way in which um, the individual indicators go through um, principal component analysis and they're rotated for weighting within an individual component and then those 12 components are equally weighted um, within the whole SPI model. So um, hopefully that answers your question, but we've got the weights and details like that in the methodology chapter. Um, Kylie's asked a good question, which I think maybe other people are wondering too. So she's curious about the next steps. Um, and she wondered if um, perhaps we could email everyone with the recording of this, which we will do. And we'll give Megan and Isabella's details. And we'll obviously keep you up to date on the plans. But do you want to talk to that now? Yep. So next steps that we've got planned are developing these state and territory scorecards. And so that's going to be slightly different to the information that's on the website at the moment in that it's showing how states and territories are performing, if they're overperforming or performing better than expected or underperforming relative to their economic peers. And so we think that's what will really help um, to inform government policy at the individual state and the territory level. We've also got the SDG scorecard that I mentioned. So we'll be able to use that as a way, as an indicator of how Australia is going um, and individual states and territories are going at achieving the sustainable development goals because the SDGs are something that not everyone's familiar with and then also their goals that are there, but we're not necessarily great at measuring them. So this can potentially offer a way of doing that. And then we hope to update the national SBI in the next two years or so, um, but we're really looking for opportunities to be doing something like those more granular level indices, even working out frameworks things like that, and then also working with other data collection agencies to see if we can really be trying to amplify collaboration across the sector, just to make sure that we're collecting indicators really well, rather than the slightly similar ones, just in very different ways. Wonderful. Um, there's a few more little questions and some lovely comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I can also show briefly the word cloud, Rhonda. Is that Yes, let's helpful? show the word cloud. Yeah. Thanks everyone for... Um... So this is from the Menti poll? Yeah, yeah. So bigger words are what came up more often. Um, so yeah, like education and poverty. Poverty is a really tricky one because it is kind of related to economic outcomes. Um, 
and when we're not including economic indicators such as the cost of housing or unemployment rates, which are kind of related to how the economy is going, it can be really tricky to uh, just include poverty as an indicator. But if we can find ways that might contribute to that, um, such as underemployment, or housing insecurity, then those are indicators that we want to include. Can you read a few of the other ones? Because they're a little bit small. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, low mental health, um, access to justice, language and terminology, homelessness, digital inclusion is a good one. So we did include the digital inclusive index in um, access to information and communication. We have, um, a, so, oh, sorry, yeah. those that are interested, we have a digital inclusion webinar on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> on Monday, yeah, <laughs> tune in for that. Um, yeah, there's a fair bit about um, domestic violence and, um, you know, access to those kinds of services, which are really important. Um, and, you know, it might be that even though your indicator on access to, to domestic violence services might not be directly included in the current index, what we hope is that people will be able to find um, a component within the social progress index that kind of speaks to their cause. So it might be personal safety or personal rights. And then you can be using um, the scores or the rank that your state or territory is in those particular components to try and advocate for change, for example. Wonderful. Okay, I think we might wrap it up there. But yes, we will email everyone with the recording and Megan and Isabella's details. So if you have further questions, that I'm sure love to speak with you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. And thanks to Megan and Isabella. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>